Romans 8.13 is where I'm going to take you today. Actually, I'm going to jump all over the place, if I'm honest. I got a lot of scripture for you. I got a lot of places God wants to take us. I believe that we're going to continue to be led to, uh, to who the Holy Spirit is, the person, power, and presence of the Holy Spirit. I, I, I want to continue to introduce you to the Holy Spirit. In Romans 8, 13, it says this, For if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if by the Spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. Church, it's time for the church to come alive. It's time for the church to begin to really live. To begin to really live according to the life that God has planned for us. It's time to come alive. My dad just recently got back from Malaysia. He goes there once, sometimes twice a year, sometimes more. He goes to Malaysia. He meets with this network of Christian believers, and the network is made up of over 40 nations around the globe that come together. And at this meeting this past uh, time that he went just recently, right after Thanksgiving, the, the speakers were all sharing on the importance of preaching once again on the person and power of the Holy Spirit. They told these nations, they said, when you go back to your churches, we believe that it is significant that in this day, in this hour, that we begin to talk again about the Holy Spirit. My dad returned to listen to a couple of my messages. He called me this weekend. He said, you're spot on. Keep preaching on the Holy Spirit. God is getting ready to do something across the nations, and it's going to be as we begin to speak on the Holy Spirit. So I'm so excited about this revival that God is about to do. But in Romans 8, 11, it says, if the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he who raised Christ Jesus from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through his spirit who dwells in you. It's time for the church to come alive. It's time for us to recognize the power of the Holy Spirit. It's time for us in our natural human state to experience a supernatural God. I'm going to take you on a journey this morning, and my hope is that by the time you walk out of the doors today, that you will realize that you no longer have to allow the circumstances of your day to dictate your life, that you can set your life in order through the person and power and leading of the Holy Spirit. It's time to get the chaos under control and set some things in order. Jesus said that he had come to bring life, and life to the fullest, and he would offer this life to you and I. But have you ever wondered how? How is God, how does Jesus offer us this life, this life to the full? How is it that we can achieve it? How is it that he will bring this full life to you and I? I think that's the question that I need you to settle into your hearts and your minds today is that how is God going to bring to me this full life that he promises? Because the reality is right now in this moment, many across this room are wondering perhaps because of what you're going through, perhaps because of what you've already been through, perhaps because of how things appear to you right now, that that promise of a full life can sometimes seem so out of reach and so out of touch for many. But I'm here to tell you today that help is on the way. Help is on the way. The helper, the Holy Spirit, is the one who brought the power to raise Jesus from the grave. He is the one who dwells with you, and he is the one who will lead you to this Promise. I want you to look at your neighbor and say, help is on the way. All right, look at your other neighbor and really mean it this time and say, help is on the way. Help is on the way. Sometimes we just simply need to hear those words. Help is on the way. Your situation might require help and help is on the way. Some in this room are dealing with 
death, the reality of its occurrence. Others in this room are, are, are dealing with the reports that death is coming. Some in this room are dealing with relationship stresses and issues and problems. Others are dealing with financial troubles. Some are dealing with where is, is, is how and uh, am I going to meet the need to pay this bill that is coming. Help is on the way. And I want to show you how this help comes to us and what this help looks like and who the helper is. I've been preaching on the one Jesus called the helper, the Holy Spirit. He is your help. And today I want to continue to introduce you to him. You say, how can you take so many weeks to introduce somebody? Take so many weeks because this somebody is not ordinary. He is extraordinary. He is not normal. He is supernatural. And so it takes a long time to introduce him to you. And so many people don't understand who he is. Therefore, they don't understand what the promise is that God gives to them. And so you need to know who he is. The first time we see the Holy Spirit first time we see him introduced to us in the Bible is in Genesis chapter 1, starting in verse 1 and 2. It says, In the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. The earth was without form and void, and darkness was over the face of the deep. And the Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters. In the verse, verses to follow, we see that God begins to speak, and creation is formed. Creation is made. And in verse 26, we find this. Then God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness. God uses these words. He says, let us, us, and our. Who is the us? Well, I talked about last week, the Trinity, God the Father, Jesus, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. God said, let us make man in our image. God the Father spoke it. Jesus was present. We know from the New Testament, John said, Jesus was there. Jesus was the Word, and the Word was God, right? That scripture, Jesus was present. Jesus was in agreement what was taking place. The Holy Spirit was hovering over the unformed earth, and he was making earth as God spoke it. Do you understand that from the beginning, it's so important that you get this, that from the beginning of creation, the Holy Spirit was in the process of making man in the image of God. Our helper, God's Spirit, has come with this purpose to make you, to transform you and I into the image and likeness of God. God is still in the business of making men and women who will be carriers of his character, who will be carriers of his nature, who will be carriers of his likeness, who will be carriers of his power. We read in Acts, I'm going to shift a little bit. We read in Acts chapter 2 and verse 35 and Luke chapter 20, we read this quote from King David who said, The Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies your footstool. Then God, and I'm going to make this all come together in just a minute. Then God the Father, he's speaking to Jesus and he says, sit at my right hand. So we've gone from Genesis. We're now in the New Testament. God speaks. The Father speaks. We see Jesus is present, right? In the New Testament, we see Jesus is present here as, as we, we read this quote. And then listen to what Romans 8.34 says. It says, who is to condemn Christ Jesus is the one who died, more than that, who was raised, who is at the right hand of God, who indeed is interceding for us. So here we have this, this verse of passage again where Jesus is at the right hand of God. He's sitting on his throne. So in, in the beginning we have God the Father speaks. We see Jesus present. We see the Holy Spirit making man, forming man. Now we see in the New Testament God the Father speaking. He's speaking to Jesus who is present, but Jesus is at his right hand. He's sitting on the throne and then it says that Jesus is making intercession for us. Why would Jesus 
be making intercession for us. The verses prior to this explain why Jesus is praying that we would open up our lives to the Holy Spirit. Why? Because he sent us the Holy Spirit to lead us into all truth, to make us his witnesses, to make us his people. He is interceding for us to be led by the Holy Spirit so that we will be transformed, that we will be made. You see, from the beginning, the Holy Spirit was in the process of making man in the image of God. Still to this day, Jesus is interceding and praying that man will be made in his image. The Holy Spirit is still in the business of making you and I, transforming you and I, making us so that we will have the character, the likeness, and the image of God. That we will have that. 2 Corinthians 5.17 says this, therefore if anyone is in Christ Jesus, he is a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. You see, it's time to be made new. It's time to be made new. The old has gone. The new has come. Stop waiting for heaven. The new has come. The Holy Spirit has come. Jesus' work on the cross is finished so that we can be made new through the power of the Holy Spirit. It's time to be made new. And I'm in the process. Anybody else in the process? Am I preaching to anybody in the process of being made new? Anybody who would say, man, I am in the process of being made new. I am in the process. Sometimes we just need to lift our hands to heaven and say, God, I am in the process. Spirit, make me new because I've got to be different. I've got to become new. I've got to be different. You can't stay the same. We can't do it without the Holy Spirit, though. We can't do it without him being present. If your ordinary is going to become extraordinary, you need the Holy Spirit. If you're going to go to new levels, if you're going to face those devils, then you will need the Holy Spirit. It is the person and power of the Holy Spirit that will make you new. I want to show you something. I want to show you Jesus' life and how Jesus laid out this example for us. And I want you to first see it in Matthew, and then we're going to jump to the same story in Luke. Jesus, in Matthew chapter 3, we find Jesus. He's 30 years old. Jesus is 30 years old. He hasn't performed a miracle yet. He's ordinary. Everybody say ordinary. Ordinary. It's hard to think of Jesus as ordinary, isn't it? It's hard to think that Jesus could have been ordinary. It's hard to imagine it because we know who he is. We know the power that he had. We know the stories of Jesus. But at 30 years old, Jesus hasn't healed anybody who is sick. At 30 years old, he hasn't raised anybody who is dead. Up until the age of 30, every funeral Jesus went to, because trust me, people died in 30 years span of Jesus' life, people died and they remained dead. For 30 years, Jesus went to funerals and people remained dead. Let that settle. Jesus, for 30 years, Jesus experienced people who were sick and they remained sick. There was no miracle. There was no change. There was no transformation. For 30 years, when Jesus came across somebody who was hungry... The way he met the need was he dropped some change in the bucket or he took them to a local restaurant or he made them food or he he gave them bread to eat. There was no miracle, no transformation, no, no all of a sudden taking two fish and turning it into enough food to feed 5,000. There was no miracle. He was ordinary. For 30 years, he was ordinary. You have to get that in your heart and in your mind because it's important to what comes next. 
30 years, ordinary. 30 years, no miracles. After his birth, no miracles for 30 years. He taught, he would teach in the temple. People were astonished at his wisdom. People were amazed. For 30 years, he did go without sin. That's pretty amazing. That's pretty astonishing. But for the most part, he was known as the carpenter's son. It's the carpenter's son. He's an ordinary man. And then all of a sudden, something shifts, something changes in Jesus. He hasn't performed a miracle, and all of a sudden, he goes to John the Baptist at the Jordan River. John is there. He's baptizing people. He's telling people they need to repent of their sins and be baptized, and they're being water baptized. And here comes Jesus. Jesus, the one without sin, that Jesus, the one who's never done anything wrong, Jesus comes to John the Baptist and he says, I need to be water baptized. And John says to him, no, there's no way. If anybody should be water baptized, it should be me by you. And Jesus says, no, we have to do this to fulfill, to fulfill God's plan, to fulfill God's purposes. I must be water baptized. Jesus, the one without sin, is setting the example of how we become extraordinary. And Jesus says, I need to be water baptized. And he commands us to do likewise. That's why he did it. Do you know Jesus was water baptized not because he needed to be. He was water baptized to show us the way. What, what am I talking about? The way to become no longer be ordinary, but to be extraordinary. Your access point is something called repentance. Your access point to the Holy Spirit, to the helper, is repentance. Jesus comes to the waters of repentance. He comes to the baptism waters of repentance. He didn't need to, but he shows the way for you and I. And he says, come to the waters of repentance. We have to find a way to repent. Turn from our wickedness. Turn from the things the Bible calls sin. That we can be cleansed in the waters of baptism by Jesus that our lives can be cleansed. We, we believe in water baptism. We preach that people should be water baptized. Why? Because we believe that we should follow the example of Jesus. And water baptism is a public confession of our repentance and our faith in Jesus Christ. And so we encourage every believer that comes to the saving knowledge of Jesus Christ to be water baptized. Why? Because without repentance, you will remain ordinary. Ordinary. Jesus was ordinary. But he, we know he was also extraordinary because he was without sin, but yet he's showing us, ordinary men and women, how we too can become extraordinary. And look at what happens, Matthew 3, 16. And when Jesus was baptized immediately, he went up from the water, and behold, the heavens were opened to him, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and coming to rest on him. And behold, a voice from heaven said, This is my beloved Son, with whom I am well Please. And then we're going to jump to Luke chapter 4. We're going to pick up the story. Luke chapter 4 verse 1. And Jesus, full of the Holy Spirit, returned from the Jordan and was led by the Spirit in the wilderness for 40 days, being tempted by the devil. To have the Spirit, we must have repentance. That's why Jesus said in John chapter 14, he was telling his disciples, he said, in a little while I won't be here. Jesus was talking about himself, the man. And in a while, this man that you see in front of you, this man of flesh, you're not going to see him anymore. He's going to be gone. And then he said this confusing statement. He said, in a little while, I'm going to be gone, but in, a, in, in just a little longer, you'll see me again. And the disciples are like, huh? And, and we read that verse, and we're like, huh? How does that make any sense? Because Jesus, the man, would not be seen anymore, but Jesus, the Spirit, the Spirit of God, would come again. He'd be with them. He would dwell with them. And he said he wouldn't leave them anymore. And, and the Holy Spirit's going to come and dwell with them. And, and, and here we see this. 
that, that Jesus is setting, setting things up for us, and he's saying, okay, we have to have repentance to have the Holy Spirit. Jesus didn't need to repent, but he went through water baptism to show us the example. With repentance, God then fills us with the Holy Spirit. Jesus is water baptized. He's full of the Holy Spirit, and he still hasn't done any miracles. Not one. Full of the Holy Spirit. No miracle. The Bible says, full of the Holy Spirit. He's led by the Spirit into the desert, into the wilderness, to be tempted by the devil. Why did Jesus need the Holy Spirit? Ever ask yourself that question? Why did Jesus, isn't Jesus God, right? Isn't he the Son of God? Isn't he the, the, the you know, we have God the Father, Jesus, Son of God, the Holy Spirit, the three persons of the Godhead. Why did Jesus need the Holy Spirit? You know, he's doing us a favor. He's showing us why, but I, it's more than that. Jesus needed the Holy Spirit, we're told in Acts chapter 2 and verse 22, Peter is preaching and he says this, men of Israel, hear these words, Jesus of Nazareth, a man attested to you by God with mighty works and wonders and signs that God did through him in your midst. Acts 10, 38, Peter said this, how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and with power. Peter said, Jesus of Nazareth, a man, a man, don't be confused, he's still God, Jesus is God, but in order to fulfill the redemption of mankind, he had to come to earth as a man. He had to come as an ordinary man. Jesus had to come in the likeness and image of man. Jesus was a man. 30 years he operated just like anybody else. The only difference was he was without sin. He was able to do that because he was still fully God. But he comes as man. And he sets this example that man without the spirit is ordinary. In the beginning, man was made in the image of God, but when Adam and Eve sinned, something was lost. They lost the presence of God. God had to separate himself from them. Jesus comes in the New Testament, and he restores that union, and he shows us how we, through him and repentance, we can have this union with the Holy Spirit. Through the Holy Spirit, we too can go from ordinary to extraordinary, from natural to supernatural, but we cannot miss a step. Don't go looking for the power just yet. Don't skip the step. You see, there's a lot of people that want to jump down to, 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 to the, the, the verse that says, Jesus returned from the wilderness in power. Everybody wants to skip to that part. Everybody wants to jump to that part. Churches pray for revival for the in power part. But hear me out. It, God does not want to bring revival so that we can be touched by the power of the Holy Spirit so we can have a Holy Ghost hoedown. God wants us to be full of the Holy Spirit so that we can walk through the next step. We like to skip the next step because we want the power. Everybody likes the power because the power means miracles are coming. I like the power. I like when miracles show up. I like when people are healed, when the dead are raised. I like when blind eyes are open. I like when deaf ears uh, are open and people can hear. I like when, when, when poverty is demolished. I like when miracles happen. I like when miracles show up. But you've got to understand something about the power of the Holy Spirit. The power of the Holy Spirit comes. It shows up that people's eyes would be open to God so that more people would be filled with the Holy Spirit for the next step. Not for the power step, for the next step. Everybody say the next step. You want to know what the next step is? It's where you're made new. 
It's where you go from being ordinary to extraordinary. You know what makes somebody extraordinary? When the tempter comes, when the devil comes, and he tempts you with the ways of the, of the world, tempts you with everything that would draw you away from Christ, and you say, no, no, no. That's what makes you extraordinary. That's what makes you in the likeness and image of God. Me walking through the streets and healing the sick and, and raising the dead to life doesn't make me more like God. Doesn't put me in the image and likeness of God. All it does is open people's eyes to his power. To be in the image and the likeness of God. To be like him is to have his character. To have his mind, to think like him, to act like him, to behave like him, to go without sinning. That's what makes a believer extraordinary instead of being ordinary. And there's only one way that we can operate like that, and that's being full of the Spirit of God. Don't miss this step. You see, the thing that you repented of needs to be the thing you have victory over. We need to be dead to our sin and alive in Christ Jesus. I need the Holy Spirit to help me put my sin to death. Without the Spirit, I just go through the motions because I'm ordinary. I'm like any other man. Without the Spirit, I'm dead in my sin, not to it. Romans 8, 11 says this. If the Spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead and dwells in you, he who raised Christ Jesus from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through his Spirit who dwells in you. So then, brothers, we are debtors, not to the flesh, to live according to the flesh. For if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if by the Spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. For all who are led by the Spirit of God are sons of God. See, there's something that needs to be put to death in your life. Not just to be forgiven of, but be put to death. And that something is sin. Jesus came not just so that you could find forgiveness and discover his grace and his mercy. Understand that Jesus came to make a way to bridge the gap that once again you could go through the process of being made into something different than ordinary man. Adam in the garden was being made in the image of God through the power of the Holy Spirit. God is now still making man in, the, in his image if we would allow him to through the power of his Holy Spirit. But it starts with real repentance. Jesus showed us the way. He said it starts with repentance. Even though he didn't need to be forgiven of anything, he started there so that we could see the way and see the process. And, and we think, okay, now I'm going to give my life to Jesus. I'm going to repent to Jesus. And I'm going to be filled with the Holy Spirit. And now I'm going to walk in power. People are going to be healed. All these great things are going to happen in my life. Miracles are coming. But we miss a step. We miss the step, one of the most important steps, perhaps the most important role of the Holy Spirit, making us new, where we begin to resist temptation. You see, Jesus, it's interesting, Jesus goes into the de desert and the devil tempts him. He tempts him and he's tempting. What is he tempting? He's tempting the man. He's tempting Jesus. He's, he's tempting his authority. He's asking him to give in to this temptation. Why? Because if Jesus gives in to the temptation, then he becomes ordinary. And if Jesus becomes ordinary, then when he goes to the cross, it's no different than any other criminal who went to the cross. Couldn't pay the price for our sins. Jesus had to do something extraordinary and say no to sin. 
That's what makes him God. He can say no to sin. He's powerful. He doesn't need those things. He's all powerful. He's perfect. He's holy. He's righteous. He's loving. He's, he, he's full of mercy and grace. He's full of justice. He's, he's everything good. No sin in him because he's God. And in the same way, we, full of the Holy Spirit, have this power, this authority to overcome the temptations that come against us. Those temptations that make us ordinary if we give in to them. And now we have the ability to overcome them through the power of the Holy Spirit, to become extraordinary, to become like God in a way where, where we, we are able to become a little more holy. And are we going to get it right every time? No, that's why he stays with us for the journey. It's not going to change overnight, but I have to work to make it right every day. I need the Holy Spirit. Stay with me, Holy Spirit. Don't leave me. Don't forsake me. Why would he leave me? Because I've sinned. Because like Adam sinned, God had to be separated from him. But because of God's grace, because of Jesus' sacrifice on the cross, now the Holy Spirit doesn't have to leave you because of your sin. So he stays with you and he sticks with you and he, he holds you tight and he says, come on, we're going to get through this. We're going to push through it. Tomorrow you're not going to give in to it. Today you might have fallen. Tomorrow you're going to get back up but stay with me because I'm making you into something different. I'm making you into the image and likeness of your Lord and Savior. You're come, becoming something extraordinary. One step at a time. You know, I'm going to close with this. I'm going to speak to those in the church for a moment. Perhaps you're visiting with us today and and you've never been in a church before, and, or maybe you're just coming today to visit, but I'm, I'm, I'm going to preach to the church for a moment. I'm going to preach to those in the church that have been praying for revival. I know that this is a church that believes for revival and prays for revival, and many in this church are believing for souls and people to come into the kingdom. We're believing for, for, for many to experience a touch from heaven, but I, I need to speak to you for a second. We need to be careful that we do, don't become a church or believers that pray for a mighty move of God just simply so that we can experience the power of the Holy Spirit. I'm afraid of that church. I'm afraid of a church that wants the power of the Spirit without being led by the Holy Spirit. I'm so afraid of that church. In fact, I'm so afraid of that church, I will run from that church. And here's the reason why. A church that has some form of power but lacks the fruit of the Spirit. A church that has a form of power that doesn't come from repentance is dangerous. Extremely dangerous. It's a church that will lead you astray. Listen to the words of Jesus in Matthew 24, 23. He said, then if anyone says to you, look, here is the Christ, or there he is, do not believe it. He's speaking of the end, and he says, for false Christ and false prophets will arise and perform great signs and wonders so as to lead astray, if possible, even the elect. You see, if we just simply go looking for a touch or for the power, and that's what we believe the Holy Spirit is for, you better believe the deceiving spirits are going to seep into that church and they will lead people astray because the Holy Spirit comes that we would repent and believe upon the Lord Jesus Christ that we might be made new and restored and delivered and set free from the sin that leads to death in our lives, that we would begin to live and live redeemed and free and set free from the bondage of the pit of hell. It is time that we as a church understand why God wants to send revival. Because God wants to make people new again. New again. Set free. 
No more addiction. No more challenges. No more of that junk. I am an overcomer in Christ Jesus. I am made new, set free. Church, God wants revival. He wants it more than we do. But he wants it so that the church can be delivered, so that people can be delivered, so the lost can find Jesus and be delivered and set free from the law of sin and death. Church, we cannot want revival just simply to have a touch from heaven. We got to want revival to be filled with the Holy Spirit. I want revival so that I'm so full of the Holy Spirit that I don't, when I'm I'm walking the street or I'm walking through a Home Depot or I'm, I'm heading to work or I'm driving in my car and the temptation to sin arises, I don't have to open the book and try and figure out what Jesus says about it. I want to be so full of the Holy Spirit that in that moment, in that instant, right there on the spot, he calls me out and he says, don't give in to that. This is what Jesus says about it. And I resist the temptation and I turn from the evil way and I be led by the Holy Spirit into truth. See, that's what revival is. Real revival is changing.